1 Corinthians 15. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Well, it's a day for miracles, and those of you who know me will know that keeping it short would be a miracle in and of itself, and I'll do my best. But it's Resurrection Sunday, so I'm supposed to say, He is risen, and you say? There you go, now we know your church background. We knew you were Baptist anyway, because you're all sitting at the back. <laughs> but, that, but that helps us as well. That helps us as well. Um, so, we are talking this morning briefly about the resurrection. And it was lovely this morning with our additional readings. We normally have one reading. We got spoiled with four today. And it was good just to hear the flow of the passion narrative, the crucifixion, the resurrection. And there's so many points in all of that I could have picked up. The one that really struck me in the readings this morning was where, you know, Pilate washes his hands of the whole situation. And they say, let his blood be on our hands. Man, no wonder that generation, you know, the scripture says about them, you know, that it would be better for Sodom and Gomorrah on the last day than that generation of Israel. That wicked generation. His blood be on our hands. Well, folks, the good news is, is that his blood need not be on any of our hands, but yet his blood can cover us and cover our sins. And in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1, we have Paul reminding us of the gospel. And uh, he says in verse 1, Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, by which you were being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. If you're saved, if you're a Christian, there is one reason, one reason only, that you're a Christian. You're not a Christian because you go to church. You're not a Christian because your parents go to church. You're not a Christian because you turn up for hatches, matches, and dispatches. That's uh, christenings, weddings, and funerals, in that order. Or Easter, or Christmas, or whatever else. You know, you're not a burger because you go to McDonald's. You're not a Christian because you occasionally turn up at a church. You're a Christian because you've received the gospel. And you stand on that gospel. The gospel message is what makes us a Christian. It is a methodology by which Christ's forgiveness, his redemption from sin, is applied to us. We don't, we don't get forgiveness by turning up to church. We're not forgiven because after we were raised in a Christian home. We are forgiven because we believe by faith on the gospel. We're, it works the other way. We're, we're, not, we're not unsaved because we mess up. We're not unsaved because we have a terrible background. We're not unsaved because we did too many things wrong. Again, it is faith in the gospel that saves us. And gospel simply means this, good news. And here is the good news, verse 2. For I deliver to you of, as of first importance uh, what I also received... So in other words, I gave to you what someone gave to me. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. In other words, the gospel message is the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we like to throw in all of these other things and there are many things that we should throw in in the sense of teaching and what is true and what is right. But when it comes to what saves a person, it is their faith in Christ's death for their sins, his burial and his resurrection. And that's what we celebrate this day and every day. We celebrate that. And... I think sometimes in our church circles, we sometimes forget just how much people can be wrong about and still be saved. I, I think that we'll have surprises, happy surprises, when we uh, go to heaven because we're going to find that there are a lot of people who trusted in the essentials, though they got a whole bunch of other stuff wrong. 
And we don't want to get stuff wrong. We want to be people of the word. We want, to, we want to know what God has told us. We want to grow in that. We believe that the Bible is what changes us. It's God's methodology for speaking to us, for transforming us by his Holy Spirit. But nevertheless, this is what saves someone. So let's, let's look at it. He died for our sins. And then there's a very specific point here. He died for our sins. We understand that Jesus' death on the cross was not just something that happened. It wasn't just that he, he happened to die. It wasn't that he was a criminal. The Bible is explicitly clear that Jesus is the perfect, spotless Passover lamb. You see, no man could die for sin because no man is perfect. Only God is perfect. And yet God can't die. So what happened is that God became man. At a point in human history, God became man in the person, the humanity of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ was able to fill those criteria. As a man, he was able to die in his humanity. And as God, he was perfect and sinless. And therefore, his offering, his sacrifice was sufficient it was acceptable to God for all sin. Guys, there were centuries of a sacrificial system. When we go into Hebrews, we're going to look at Hebrews talking about that sacrificial system. We'll refer back to the book of Leviticus where it was there. And there was this, this convoluted, complicated, all-encompassing sacrificial system that was there to help you deal with sin and, and, and failings in your life. My goodness, there was entire chapter in the book of Leviticus to tell you the precise sequence of washing that had to be done if you were healed from leprosy. An entire chapter on, oh, you've been, not, not you are in sin, but you've been healed, so now go and do this kind of washing and cleaning and what have you. And, and by the way, as an aside, the fascinating thing is, do you know how many times that passage, that, that chapter of Leviticus, had actually been used in Israel's history prior to the coming of Christ? Zero. Big fat zero. And then Jesus comes along and he sends, in Luke's gospel, ten healed lepers to go and make an offering for them for their healing. He was making it clear to them he was the Messiah and he was the chosen one. So the sacrifice of Christ is such that because he is sinless, because he was perfect, his death was sufficient for our sins. That's the whole point. The point is, is that his sacrifice pays for our sins. In a sense, God was punishing him, but not punishing him for what he's done, but for what we've done. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that he who knew no sin became sin for our sakes that we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, there is a swap, there is an exchange. Those of you who ever watch the wonderful nationwide, worldwide sport that is properly called football because it involves feet and balls, as opposed to this hand egg thing that you call football, I don't, I don't understand this, but, but if, you, if you ever watch football, they have substitutes. And what will happen in, in a game of, I'm, I'm going to make a sacrifice here, it's a special case, soccer. What happens in, in soccer is, is that there can be a substitute where one player comes off the field and another comes on in their place. They have to be the same 11 on the field, same number, but one comes off and one comes on. And in the same way, Christ is our substitute. So there we are in the playing field of sin. There we are, bound by our sin, captivated by our sin, unable to be free from our sin, and the consequences of our sin, not just now, but for all eternity. And Christ says, I'm coming on. And so he leaves his place of righteousness and comes to our place of sin, and we leave our place of sin and go to his place of righteousness. We get his righteousness as if we had lived it. And he is punished for our sin as if he did it. It is the least fair swap in the history of the universe. 
You could take your house, your life savings, and you could swap it with me for this pen. That'd be great, and you're welcome to do that, by the way. Not just hypothetical. But it, it would still be a very fair swap compared to that swap. That Christ was punished for our sin in our place. That's what it means he died for our sins. But you know what that means? As it stands by itself, it means absolutely nothing. Listen, if I pick up this pen and hold it high in the air, that means that you will have your sins forgiven. Anyone can say it. It doesn't mean anything. This is why when Jesus was on the earth, there's this wonderful miracle where this, this guy is brought, and he's a cripple, and his friend's bringing him on a stretcher to Jesus. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, they're watching him to make sure he doesn't break any rules, you know, like healing on the Sabbath or not wearing a tie at Easter and terrible things like that. And, and he's kind of watching and keeping an eye on them. That, that, sorry, they're keeping an eye on him to make sure he doesn't do that. And he knows what they're thinking, and he wants to heal this man. And, and, and so he says, look, your sins are forgiven. And they're shocked. I mean, who, who can forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. And he says, but so that you know that I have the power to forgive sins, I'm going to do a, something that to you is harder. I'm going to say, take up your mat and walk. He proved that what he was saying in the spiritual realm was true by what he did in the physical realm. That's why Paul doesn't stop with Jesus dying for our sins. He was also buried and raised on the third day. Because here's the deal. When Jesus says, sin and death are conquered, you will never be punished for any of your sins because I've been punished for your sins. You won't have to die because I died in your place. Eternal life is yours. When Christ offers you that, you know he means it and you know it's true. You know how you know it? Because he rose from the dead. It's all well and good saying that you've conquered sin and death if you're still dead. Buddha, dead. Muhammad, dead. Joseph Smith, dead. Everyone's dead. But Jesus is alive. And look what he says. This is fascinating to me. And if you're a historian, this should be even more interesting for you. Because he goes on to say, um, and, and by the way, regulars here, you know how painful this is for me to skim over the phrase, according to the scriptures. Twice. Twice. I know you've got to go, so I'm being gracious here, but this is breaking my heart. Isaiah 53, by the way, that's where you want to go. We're going to look at Psalm 22 in our Mark Gospel studies as we come to the cross in the next few weeks. But Isaiah 53 shows the prophecy of the suffering and the death of the Messiah. But it also says that not only will he die, but he'll be buried in a rich man's tomb, which is what happened. And then it says that his days will be prolonged. Well, how do you prolong the days of someone who's dead? Resurrection. All prophesied by Isaiah 53. Hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ came. But anyway, my point was, going on, according to the scriptures. And after that, he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter. And then to the twelve. We read about that this morning. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters. If your version says brothers, by the way, it's an inclusive word. Brothers and sisters will allow for the women as well. At one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Just in passing, by the way, note how Paul cannot use the word die in reference to Christians. He just can't bring himself to do it. How can you talk about death in this context? You can't talk about death. We fall asleep, Paul says. We are, we are gone for a while, but we will come back with him. He'll tell us that later in this chapter. But look at what happens here. He's saying, look, it wasn't just me. It wasn't just Peter. It wasn't just the disciples. At one point, there were 500 people. And maybe, maybe he does mean brothers, in which case he's not even counting the women. That was fairly common. Maybe there's more than 500 people. There's 500 plus people who saw the resurrected Christ at one time. And why does he say they're still alive? This is why he says they're still alive. So you can go and ask them. 
It's like, it, it's, you know, people, people are saying, you know, oh, well, we can't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. And then people just wrote what they liked. He's saying this at a time when the people who witnessed it were still alive. You go and ask them. You can go and check the details. You can go and follow up for yourself. The resurrection of Jesus Christ isn't some story. It isn't some fairy tale. It's something that was verifiable. It's something that when people at the time were like, they're talking about him rising from the dead. Are you sure? Is this possible? Is this real? And there were people that you could go and ask that would tell you the same story again and again. I was there. 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 You know in the Mormon church, they have all these extra writings, Book of Mormon and Doctrines and Covenants and stuff like that. They have all their extra books. And, and you know how they believe that that came? It, it came in these tablets that had to be translated with special glasses. I'm not even making this stuff up. The, the unreadable tablets, magical glasses to translate them. And who claims to have seen them? Two people. It was, whenever you have cultic revelation, so-called, it's always done in private, in secret. Jesus rose again from the dead publicly, clearly. Everything was there to be verified, to be seen, to be, to be clear to all. There was no doubt. There was no question mark. And this is why Paul says it. He wants them to be absolutely convinced and sure that the resurrection is something that will never be forgotten or doubted because it can be attested to. It can be attested to. Now, I want to skim ahead a little bit now to verse 20. Um, 20. There's so much in this chapter. He talks about how essential the resurrection is for salvation. But he says in verse 20, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam will die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in their own order. Christ the first fruit, and then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Guys, this is the neglected middle child of Resurrection Sunday. All the middle children are there. Yeah, we're neglected, yeah. You know, this is, this is the overseen one. This is the one that's hidden away. This is, this is the doctrine we forget about. That Christ rose from the dead was not the beginning and the end of resurrection. We, we saw this morning in the passage that was read to us that many others were resurrected in an earthquake that same day and went out and told people, hey, I know you were just at my funeral, but here I am kind of thing, you know. We, again, more testimony, more, more verifiable facts. And it is a statement, it's an indication that this resurrection is not over. What Paul says here is that if Christ has been raised from the dead, he is the first fruit of those who've fallen asleep. So Christ dies, and then on the third day, so day one, the day he dies, day two in between, and then on the third day after that, so what we would call two days later, but on the third day, Christ then rose. So there's this period of time when he is perceived to be fallen asleep. Now you and I will know people who have faith in Christ who are no longer with us. To use Paul's terminology, they've fallen asleep. They're no longer with us. Paul says that Christ is the first fruit of resurrection. He says that the dead in Christ will rise. Look at the timing of it. But each in his own order, verse 23. Christ the first fruit, and then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule, every authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. 
Christ has conquered death. He proved that with his resurrection. And one day, death will be destroyed completely. And that will be shown because all of us who belong to Christ will be raised again. We will be raised again. If you believe that Jesus physically rose from the dead and you don't believe that you will physically rise from the dead, you need to read 1 Corinthians 15 properly end to end. Get your head in this text and read it. This is our future and there will be an end and all kingdoms will be destroyed and Christ will rule and reign and those who belong to him will be there ruling and reigning, enjoying the kingdom in resurrected glorified bodies. What does that mean? Oh, I don't think any of us know fully, but I can tell you this. It means no more sickness, no more death, no more aging. It means that these bodies will no longer hold sin. Paul talks about our sinful flesh. You know how it's natural for us to do certain things that the Bible tells us not to do? That's because it's natural to sin. We've got sin built into our DNA. We've all got different DNA, so some of us are prone to some sins and others are prone to other sins, but we're all prone to sin. But it's going to be removed. It's going to be clean. We're going we're to have glorified, sinless, untainted, un unraveling bodies. We're going to have bodies that, that don't fall apart. We're going to have bodies that don't lead us to sin. Sin will be conquered, death will be conquered, and we will be with Christ. I want to end this morning by reading, see I can do it short, but I want to read the last bit of this chapter because this is just so good. Verse 50, he concludes this chapter on the resurrection. He says this, I tell you this, brothers and sisters, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Do you understand that? We can't go as we are. We have to be clean. Sin can't go in. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, so not everyone's going to die. There'll be some people who will still be alive when he comes. And in that moment, in that brief moment, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, never to die again. And, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death is defeated. It's sting. The harm that it carries is sin. Sin leads to death. And they've been conquered by Christ. And it is our faith in this Easter message. The death for our sins the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's placing our trust in Him. Committing ourselves to Him in that. Trusting Him. Guys, my eggs are in one basket. I hope you have that expression. I use all these, <laughs> these little proverbial expressions, these little idioms, and I hope they translate okay. But my eggs are in one basket. I, I, am not, I have no plan B. I have no backup plan. My trust is in this and this alone. That when my time comes, I will see my Creator, my Saviour. And I will be able to stand in His presence and look in His face. Because His blood has cleansed my sin. He cannot reject me because it would mean rejecting Christ. And my encouragement to us this morning is twofold. 
if we're not Christians, if we're not sure, if we haven't placed our trust in Jesus, if we haven't decided to follow him, if we haven't turned from sin and turned to him who frees us from sin, if we have not yet done that, then this is as good a day as any to do it. And for those of us who have, Paul says, my beloved brothers, in the final verse, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. The resurrection of Jesus is the assurance of eternal glory, which is our motivation for present day living. Everything you do will either be burnt up as worthless or be rewarded for in eternity. We have one life. Let's make it count in light of his resurrection and hours to come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. Thank you for the sacrifice of your Son in our place for our sins. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Apart from him, we would be rightly judged and condemned for our many sins deliberate, unconscious sins of action, sins of omission. Thank you that you are kind, that you're merciful, that you forgive. Thank you for saving us. Amen.